This is part three of the Hair Transplant Roadshow conversation with Dr. Ken Washenik, focusing on hair multiplication. This is part three of my interview with Ken Washenik, President and Chief Medical Officer of Bosley Medical Group and a recognized expert on hair multiplication. In part one, we covered the past. In part two, we covered the present. Now we get to talk about the future of hair multiplication. Please support this program by selecting like, subscribe, and requesting notifications when our next episode is available. Ken, what I'm not going to do is ask you to predict when hair multiplication will be available to our patients. Historically, the answer to that is always five years away. <laughs> so it's a constantly moving target. I won't, I won't. Instead, I want to start by saying, let's assume that at some point in the future, the various hurdles are overcome and we have an FDA-approved method of hair multiplication. What will that look like from the patient's perspective? Patient goes to their surgeon, he's been over harvested in the past, he's been rejected for further surgery, but he heard that there's something new to give him hope, and he shows up in your office. Okay, so the, the closest future that, that I think we're looking at are is researchers, including our group, that are regenerating restoring growth to existing hair follicles, right? So when we, when we, when we bald, we, we go through this process of miniaturization. So, uh, you know, like here, this part of my head is like the emperor's new hair. It's covered with hair follicles, but you can't see them. So I think the first products that will come out uh, sooner rather than later will be products that will turn the growth of these follicles back on using cellular technology as opposed to uh, pharmacology, pharmacologic approaches, uh, you know, drugs. So those will continue to exist and advance. There are a lot of great drugs that are uh, getting into the clinics now. So that's that's uh, something that you and I and all of our patients can look forward to. And at the same time, where the development of cell-based restoration is uh, is much closer than it was before. Uh, you've used the term when we've discussed these things before. Uh, saying, well, we don't talk about hair cloning, we talk about hair multiplication, but whichever you call it, we're, I'm talking about follicle cell multiplication for the near future. A little more distant future, both from our group and other groups, is to take pluripotent cells. So whether you draw blood, take a skin specimen, uh, even pluck hairs to get material to start and then reverse engineer those in the laboratory so they're pluripotent and you can drive them in whatever direction you want. And, uh, and we've published in the past that you could drive those cells to reconstitute uh, multiple types of cells in a, in, a, in a piece of skin, including hair follicles, uh, the erector pili muscles, the, the glands, sebaceous glands that are in the hair. So those, that approach of taking cells and forming in the laboratory, if you will, in the test tube, in the Petri plate, actual little hairs that you can transplant in to the scalp. That's the next wave. First will be uh, a cell uh, regeneration, turning on of existing hair follicle structures. The next one will be like hair transplantation, where you will, in fact, uh, produce in the laboratory small hair follicle uh, structures, organs, that you will place just like we do with hair transplantation now to help expand the areas of coverage and importantly, be able to treat hair loss in areas that don't have existing hair follicles. So, you know, we, we in the clinic see a lot of folks who unfortunately have scars, whether that's from trauma or burns, or a scarring alopecia that has destroyed the existing follicular structure. In that case, uh, this uh, regeneration where you put cells in to turn on follicular growth won't have utility. The, the place that will have utility is when you create an entire hair follicle structure that you're going to place into that area that has no follicular structures. And that will really look like hair transplantation. And then there's a big difference between those two, the cell-based one that you were talking about, which I'm going to ask another question, but it's more like, you know, finasteride and, and minoxidil will strengthen and grow and improve hairs that you already have, but it will not grow hair where there's no hair. But the second part is really, that's the holy grail, where if you, if you give me those hairs and I can transplant it, and now we 
theoretically have an unlimited supply. But when you say a product, are we talking about a cream we're going to rub on, an injection? Uh, what is that? What form is that going to take? Again, from the patient's perspective, you're going to come in, you're going to, as you say, draw blood or take a sample. They're going to come back into the office two months later. What's going to happen to that patient or what will the patient do to to use those cellular-based products. Okay, so the cell-based one, where we, we, we regenerate the growth of existing follicles, and and again, there are follicles here. You know, George Katsourelis' work at the University of Pennsylvania showed that you have existing, that you have the same uh, number of follicles that have follicle stem cells when you're balding as you do where you have hair. So there's great hope to be able to turn those hair follicles back on. So with drugs, with medications, or with cells. Our, the approach we've been looking at is with cells. The, the, that would, the, the way that would uh, translate for me, a patient, is I would go into my doctor's office. I'd go to see Dr. Haber. You would take a small uh, biopsy from my scalp where I have hair. That would be shipped to the cell culturing facility, and they would separate those cells, expand them, in our case, the dermal and the epidermal cells, they put them back together in a combination uh, su suspension of cells and send them back to you, uh, Dr. Haber, in your office. And and I would come back in as your patient two weeks later. And that that just that time period will depend on what the final culture system is. We've looked at three weeks. We've looked at two weeks. Two weeks looks like where we are now. Two weeks later. The cells would come back to you. I'd come into your office, and you would inject those cells intradermally into the area that you wanted to treat, the area that I wanted to restore hair growth as your patient. The next generation of creating new hair follicles, that would be um, uh, different. You would, again, take some tissue, you would send it to the laboratory. So the patient would come into your office, you would get some tissue, whether that was a blood draw, uh, a piece of uh, tissue from the scalp, some plucked hairs, you would send those to the, uh, the laboratory, the biotech company. They would grow those cells. I can't uh, give you a timeline now as to how many weeks uh, that they would grow those cells up and create new hair follicles. And those new hair follicles would come back to you in your office, Bob, to place them, just like you do hair transplantation, place those hair follicles that have been grown in the lab into recipient sites in the areas of your patient's scalp where they wanted more hair. That's great, because my next question was going to be, what, what's, what about the surgeon's perspective? Am I, going to be, am I going to be forced into retirement, replaced by multiplication centers offering full heads of hair with no scarring, or will hair multiplication be reserved for special cases, or will I be licensed in some way? So there's still going to be a role for the hair loss specialist, whether or not they're a surgeon. It could be non-surgeons that do this, obviously, but that first part, uh, and then the surgeons planting hairs uh, will be the second part. So I don't have to look for retirement plans just yet, I guess. You do not. And we both know that, sadly, there are an awful lot of patients with hair loss for different reasons uh, that come to us for some help. And and uh, I think the more options we have to give them, to give them hope, just going to be that many more patients that come to see you. And obviously, there's going to be you know a cost factor to this, which we won't discuss, uh, but it's not going to be insignificant, at least for the, for the early adopters. Uh, and then that will improve over time. But for the people that are that are needy and are motivated, uh, this is very exciting. And then this offshoot of the research, like you say, for livers, kidneys, heart muscle, and whatever else, if this can if we can grow hair to know basically, then we can use that for so many other things. It's, a, it's incredible uh, technology, incredible research. You know, as, as dermatologists and dermatologic researchers, uh, we know how valuable the skin is and hair is as a model for the, these other areas because it's very accessible. And so, yeah, you're right. It's the, the technology that's showing us how to grow new hair follicles is also showing us how to, to rebuild and regrow other organs. So, yeah, I agree with you. This is a, it's exciting, exciting technology uh, for our hair and ultimately for the rest of us. Now, you, you mentioned one thing about cost, and I think that's important because uh, if we look at medication, 
at one end, which typically are less expensive than, say, a, a full hair transplantation process procedure, uh, likely this will be somewhere in between. When, when this technology comes out, the cell-based injectable cells will probably be somewhere between the, the cost of medications and the, the cost of su uh, surgical hair transplantation. Can't give you a number until we actually finish the thing, but um, then uh, then we'll, maybe we'll have a little little firmer numbers we can wrap our brains around. Ken, what else should our listeners know about hair multiplication or either the past, present, or future that we didn't have a chance to talk about? I think that the best part is, uh, which is funny for me to say, is we're not the only ones working on it. So there are some great researchers. I mentioned we had a, a group of around 500 hair researchers at the World Congress of the Hair Research Societies, same time as the eclipse in Dallas. And uh, a number of groups are working at it with different approaches, uh, Different culture systems, hanging drops, uh, uh, you know, individual culture chambers, uh, using dermal cells, using epidermal cells, combinations of the two. So I think the best thing is that it's not all your money is not in one camp. You know, there, there are a lot of folks uh, that will bring probably different, slightly different nuanced versions of this to the patients with hair loss to the doctor's offices, uh, just as we have different drugs, whether it's treating psoriasis, acne, hair loss, uh, I think there'll be a number of options available uh, to uh, physicians treating hair loss and patients looking to restore their hair. And I know we all look forward to being able to tell our patients that it's not you know, five years away, that there's something we can do uh, now. Well, well, to the extent that we can cover a topic like this in a fairly brief period of time, I think we did a pretty good job. And of course, if there are any significant advances worth talking about, we can certainly speak again. Ken, at this point in my show, I generally ask my guests to let our listeners know how to get in touch with their office. But I think everybody knows how to reach Bosley Medical Group. So I'll just say thank you for sharing your expertise on this fascinating topic. And I certainly hope that we can offer this treatment to our patients before the next Great American Solar Eclipse, which will occur in the year 2044. Thank you again, Ken. See everybody next time on the Hair Transfer Road Show. I hope we make these recordings obsolete the next time we talk. Sounds good. Thank you, Ken.